Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Fridays with Vistage webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few items to help you participate in today's webinar. If you're experiencing technical difficulties joining the webinar session, please dial support at 888-259-8414. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you'd like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of your control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. Please note that a PDF of today's presentation is available for download on your control panel. A recording of this presentation will be sent to attendees via email within the next week. I would now like to introduce the moderator for today's webinar, Anne Petrick. Hello. We are so glad you could join us for Cyber Threats and Solutions for Small and Mid-Sized Businesses. Recent research conducted by Vistage and our partners Cisco and the National Center for the Middle Market revealed that few small and mid-sized businesses have the necessary safeguards in place to protect against a devastating cyber attack. Today, Joe Galvin, our Chief Research Officer for Vistage, and his panel of subject matter experts will help you assess your risk and apply best practices in the areas of people, process, and technology to create an effective cybersecurity strategy. And now, our speaker, Joe Galvin. I think we've all had that experience where you go to open up your laptop or your computer and you hit a key and nothing happens. The screen is dark. So we start pushing more keys and we try to turn it on and turn it off. And for a moment, we think, did I lose all my pictures? Did I lose all my contacts, all my emails, my work presentations? It's happened to all of us at some point if you've been using a computer long enough. But what if you saw this screen? What if you saw this screen and instead of it being your computer, it's your company? It's your business. You've lost your, your billing and financial data. Your employee data, that's been given up as well. W-2s have been gone. Customer data, ordership and bill data. It's all, been, it's all gone because it's been hacked. It's been taken from you. I'd like to ask you this question. Does your company have a defined cyber risk strategy that is documented and communicated to the executive leaders? This is, a critical, this is a critical question to understand. And I'd like you to ask, yes, we have a strategy that's current. Yes, the strategy is not current, and just, but we don't have a real review schedule, so we don't really have a strategy. No, we're working on it, or no, we don't. Here's the question. Do you have a defined cyber strategy? What our research has shown and what we share in our report is that only 38% of respondents, and we had close to 1,400 SMB CEOs respond, 38% have an active cyber strategy. 27% have no strategy at all. They are leaving their customer, their financial, and their employee data wide open to hacks. 62% of, of small and mid-sized businesses do not have an active, up-to-date, or active cyber strategy in place. And I find that very disconcerting. We did a similar survey in the United Kingdom, thinking in Europe, a little better sophistication, but for them it was 56% did not have an active strategy. My name is Joe Galvin, and along with Ann Pedrick and our three Vistage speakers, all experts in cybersecurity for small and mid-sized businesses, have prepared this report, and today we want to share some of those results. Today what we want to do is we want to talk about the cyber threats, and I'll introduce our experts, and we'll learn from them some of the real-world things that are happening out in the field right now. We'll give you a quick starting guide on how to get started with four steps, really questions that you need to think about to determine where you are and what you might need to do next. We'll use the classic people, process, and technology framework to wrap that around, secure, around cybersecurity. And we'll talk about those issues of people, process, and technology. And then we'll close with our experts giving some solid recommendations for action. Cybersecurity and the cyber threat and what it re represents to your business is as critical issue as you can face because it's coming after your data and data is the most important thing that you have. I wonder, has anyone seen this screen? Malibu ransomware. This was a this was a, a screen. I just pulled it from a from a Google art from a Google search. And yet the last two times I've presented this content, someone has said, Yes, I just saw that. I was in a small group meeting on Monday, and someone said, Yes, I just saw that two weeks ago. It cost me twelve hundred dollars. He goes, At first I ignored it, 
but then I couldn't get anything and it cost me $1,200. And he says, but the good news was they had an excellent customer service department. Once, once I paid the ransomware, they were very helpful in helping me decrypt and get back all my files. I would hate for that to happen to anyone. Cyber alert. Let me ask you this question. Has your company experienced a cyber attack or threat in the past 12 months that you're aware of? Think you've been hacked, maybe a phishing attack? Uh, maybe something's resident right now. Our survey shows 24% of SMBs are aware of having a cyber attack in the last 12 months. The key word there is aware because many times cyber attacks go unnoticed. They reside and sit inside your system, monitoring your data for long periods of time, waiting for the opportune moment to use that data. There's also a concept I call cyber shame. What CEO is gonna stand up and say, hey, yeah, you know, we got hacked and you know, the good news is only about half of our customers billing information uh, is still missing. Uh, only about 25% of employees have had a false income tax file because they got our W-2s and I'm pretty sure we can get our supply chain function and our production back up next week. What CEO wants to say that? You lose, you lose trust, you lose credibility, and it damages your brand for a very long time. So has your company experienced a cyber attack or threat in the past 12 months? Well, we're fortunate because today we've got Vistage speakers here. These are expert speakers in the area on the area of cyber and cybersecurity. In a moment, I'm gonna ask each one of them to uh, introduce themselves a little bit and tell us a story. But to introduce them, Ken Barnhart is president and founder of High Ground Cyber. Joining us, Michael Markeluk is a Vistage chair and a co-founder of Harbor Technology Group. And Mike Foster is founder and CEO of the Foster Institute. Between these three gentlemen, they've done over 150 Vistage Group presentations in the last year. With another 50 plus scheduled, there'll be over 200 group presentations to our members on the topics of cyber and cybersecurity. This is the Vistage speaker, an expert in their topics area, and we're fortunate to have each one of them. So let's start with you, Ken, and tales from the front, if you would. Uh, give us a brief introduction and, and share with us a, a customer story, if you would. Uh, absolutely, thanks uh, for teeing this up. Uh, so uh, I got a call about two months ago from a Vista CEO who was on his way over to their manufacturing operations in China. Uh, and the CFO uh, informed him that he had released uh, $750,000 as requested for the manufacturing uh, operation he was going to visit. Uh, and he was like, well, what do you mean? I didn't authorize that release, uh, which caused a bit of a panic. Uh, they found out that, in fact, they had uh, fallen victim to the CEO email scam. Uh, that $750,000 was redirected to an account in the Philippines. Uh, the partial good news on the story was that uh, they were insured for about a half a million dollars of that, but it still represented a quarter of a million dollar loss. Uh, as we dug into it, what we found out is that the bad actors, hackers had actively been monitoring their email system for over a year and had waited uh, until this annualized event uh, as probably the single largest dollar transfer in their operating cycle uh, in order to spring their trap. So uh, that's, uh, it's not a lot of smash and grab. Uh, hackers are oftentimes very quiet, uh, but that was uh, uh, the CEO email scam uh, just passed, uh, according to FBI crime statistics, the $5 billion mark. So unfortunately that particular CEO joined a rather ignominious club <laughs> Certainly nothing I'm sure he added to his LinkedIn profile. Probably not, no. Yeah. Michael, Michael Markelik, please share with us a little bit, a bit of your background and, and a, a story as well. Sure. Michael Markelik, uh, Harbor Technology Group. I've been, I was a Vistage member for about seven years, uh, recently became a Vistage chair and have also been working in the uh, cybersecurity arena for 20 plus years. Um, you know, I had the, the uh, I was going to say the, the opportunity to talk with, but uh, I assume the CEO didn't think it was a great opportunity. Um, a Vistage CEO um, of a U.S.-based uh, European subsidiary um, was also hit with business email compromise earlier this year. Um, interestingly, the group CEO um, from, from Germany sent an email to his U.S.-based CFO asking for a wire transfer to China. This was a partner that they had done business with in the past, but as often the case in these business email compromise, it was a fraudulent uh, wire transfer uh, bank routing information. Um, when the second request came through for a second transfer, 
uh, the U.S.-based CFO picked up the phone and called the number in the signature block of the group-based CEO. Um, someone picked up the phone. German accent sounded exactly like the um, group CEO. She made three more wire transfers, several hundred thousand dollars, none of which was recoverable. This is a perfect example of where you know technology and, sol and social engineering are being combined today to really put up a, a sophisticated threat um, to businesses. So uh, it's one of those things that we definitely need to be uh, aware of moving forward. Well, Michael, it speaks to the point that it's not just a technology solution. It requires people, skills, and a level of awareness. And I know we'll touch on that when we get deeper into our discussion on uh, the, um, the people process and technology framework. Thank you for that. Mike Foster, please share with us, sir, a little bit about your background and uh, your thoughts on uh, a customer story. Is my audio working? Can you hear me? It is. We got you good, man. Go. Fantastic. There's a CPA firm in New York City, and they got ransomware in the summertime. Unfortunately, they were unable to recover. Their ransomware wiped out all their data. They were unable to get anything done. They attempted to restore, and that was not successful. They were kind of dead in the water. But at least it was summertime. Their IT professionals said, you know what? We need to replace that firewall. We need to get much better antivirus which the CPA firm did, invested a lot of money in that. Then right in the middle of tax season, they got hit with ransomware again, shut them down, restore still didn't work. They were dead in the water all over again. They had to recover from that, it's very difficult. I frankly was surprised that they even recovered, but they did. And that's when they called us when we looked at all everything and we found out there were a bunch of missing critical security patches. Patches are also known as updates and those fix known security flaws in computer operating systems. Apple releases patches for both iPhone and computers, and Microsoft, of course, releases patches. And the partners of the CPA firm were unaware that they had so many missing patches. The biggest problem with patches is that they can lots of times break computers. Probably a lot of your listeners have experienced an issue where they installed a patch and something on their system quit working right. And as a result, IT professionals are very reluctant to install patches. Who could blame them? They don't want to crash the system. However, patches are probably one of the most important things you can do to protect your security. So immediately, the company, the CPA firm, established a plan to keep all their patches up to date. They got them all caught up, and they're keeping up with them going forward. It's a tremendous job. You have to apply patches all the time because they're new ones coming out all the time. But I'm happy to report it's been three years now and they've not had any other successful attempts. They have detected several attempts, but the patches were able to repel all of those. So even if a user clicked on a link, it didn't matter. However, it's still important to train users. It's still very important to have firewalls. It's still very important to have antivirus. The patches are free and you certainly need them too. Some people would argue that they're more important than everything else, but have them all. It's very important. So once again, it's more than just a technology solution. It's not as simple as writing a check and installing some, some pieces of technology. You need to have the process in place that is going to ensure and allow uh, that the disciplines are there, that you maintain the patch and you maintain the backups. Um, so thank you, guys. Thank you for those stories. That's, uh, that's excellent. Um, it's clear that this risk is real. And based on the stories from these gentlemen and stories that I've heard as I've been sharing this content for the last six weeks, it's clear that it is not a question of if, it's a question of when and how you will be attacked. Whether that's a phishing attack or some type of ransomware, some denial of service or some long-term, you know, super bot, um, you know, secret thing that's waiting for the right moment to pounce, this will happen. And it is incumbent upon us to protect our businesses. Uh, at Vistage Research, um, you know, uh, our job is not to answer questions. Only you can decide what's right for your business. Our job is to raise questions. And I hope that for those of you who maybe don't have a plan or the plan's stale or not ready or you kind of lag, that this motivates you to uh, get active. For those of you that currently have a plan, that you maintain that discipline and understand that the bar is always rising in terms of the threats and how they're coming at you. So we wanted to share this little piece, this piece here. Sorry. This piece here. 
uh, it comes from the, the, the report, and we'll, we'll show you how to download that. Just four steps to getting started. This comes from Tom Stewart, the executive director of the National Center for the Middle Market at The Ohio State University Fisher School of Business. And it's just a way to think about how to get started. And if you currently are in place, are you answering these questions? So uh, can you determine what your current status is? From we are active to we are lagging to we're developing to we're nowhere. Who will oversee and be accountable? It is absolutely the CEO's job to be accountable for all things. And the day-to-day -day functional operation of cyber has to rely with someone who can work with that on a daily basis. Take an inventory of your assets. Think of your data. Think of your, not just your numerical data, your contact data, your uh, intellectual property data. Everything that has to do of your digital assets, including your hardware, your software, your communications. Understand what those are and determine what's most important to you. And then decide which capabilities you're going to manage first, uh, that you're going to manage yourself versus asking someone to manage for you. One of the points that has come clear in this is that much like we have lawyers and accountants, people with levels of expertise that we don't necessarily have, we now need to engage with a cyber expert, someone who understands and can define the types of risk and apply a process like we're using the, the people process and technology framework to that. Whether you are at an active mode or whether you are currently in development or currently you're sitting on the sidelines, you need to be able to think about these in terms of questions and how you would, how you would respond to them. And then we share in the document some recommendations and then just some more questions for you to ask and to understand about how to protect and defend your business. With that, I'd like to move in. Or I'd like to give you the opportunity, if you would like to go deeper, again, from Tom Stewart in the middle market, they've created a cyber resource center and they've got a detailed self-assessment. This would probably be something to be done by an IT person, but it's a very deep and detailed assessment and give you an opportunity to really compare and contrast where you are versus where you might need to be. Uh, again, Tom Stewart, and you can find that at it's middlemarketcenter.org and then their cybersecurity center inside of that. So let's now move forward and let's talk about our framework for cybersecurity. The people process, people process and technology metaphor is one that we've used for a long time and it's one we felt would be really valuable here because as we heard in our stories and from our experts, uh, these three elements continue to be intertwined and all have to be aligned and synchronized to be successful. Um, what we've done, and, and again, this follows the outline of the document, is we've looked at people, bringing the awareness and training to employees, and, and Ken's going to touch on that and a few other things. Uh, Michael will then touch on the process element, about, about policies and processes and procedures. And then Michael will come around and talk about the technology and some of the smart choices we have to make. So with that, Ken, Ken, I don't believe we've got any background from you, so maybe give us just a quick background um, and then uh, oh. share, with us, share with us your thoughts on, on people. Absolutely. Uh, so background, uh, I'd like to kind of joke, I started my uh, career as a professional gunfighter. I was uh, in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, uh, working at Headquarters Battalion uh, directly for General Walt Boomer in surveillance and target acquisition. So that was kind of my crash course to uh, the digital battlefield and information security started uh, many, many years ago in a conflict environment. Uh, spent the last 25 years working with uh, enterprise uh, in uh, managed services and hosting environments for secure operations. So I've uh, been, been at this for a while. Uh, on the people side, I, I would kind of uh, break it down into three, three levels. One is, uh, as the thing indicates here, cybersecurity begins and ends with the CEO. Uh, most uh, the statistics indicate 96% of CEOs do not have an IT background. Uh, and as a result, um, they delegate. Uh, or what I would call actually abdicate uh, on this issue. And uh, I hear all, over and over and over again, uh, we add this is my IT guy's problem. Uh, that couldn't be any further from the truth. Uh, the CEO has to take an active role in creating a security culture. Uh, and the courts have held very consistently uh, that as the chief executive, as the senior corporate officer, 100% of the liability related to this issue falls on the CEO's shoulders. So they have to take an active role. That's kind of the key takeaway well, you got to start there uh, the second thing on the people side is most of what we find uh, is basically sourced out of human error uh, whether that be the user who clicks on something the user who gets tricked on a social engineering or spear phishing attack the network engineer who's afraid to patch something uh, and when they're being told there's a massive security risk associated with it uh, the operations manager who won't let the IT professional have any downtime to patch the servers uh, and environment because they want to run the thing too hard. Uh, uh, most of the things that we bump into have an origination in people issues. Uh, they're just not understanding or they're not properly trained or they're not being held accountable 
uh, to the correct metrics, uh, and they're creating that problem. Uh, so the, the training issue, I think, too, is a security awareness uh, is a huge factor here. It, it, people need to be running active security awareness training programs to make sure that their staff at all levels, whether that be financial personnel, HR, IT, uh, frontline, you know, customer service folks, everybody needs to be trained and aware uh, of how to recognize and combat uh, some of the threats that we're seeing. Well, you mentioned the, the importance of training, uh, training people to have an awareness. I heard a member story uh, earlier this year of a company who had experienced a phishing attack where someone had sent an email and someone responded to it, but the, the security stopped it. So they brought all their people in. They spent a half a day of training on how to recognize what a phishing attack, don't open attachments, all the training that you would you would want to go through, just as you described. Um, a week later, they, they, they ran a fake phishing attack and half of their people clicked on the attachment. So this is an issue that you described that training is not enough. You had mentioned this concept of a culture of security. Um, how would you bring a culture of security into an organization, Ken? How do you Great start question. I, that? So the, I think one of the things that, as we talk with CEOs around the country in the business arts, one of the things that I point out is that the bad actors are, are not, you know, this kind of idea of the Matthew Broderick war games you know, some prepubescent teen in his mom's basement, two computers short of a girlfriend, that's not a hacker. Um, they're these highly sophisticated criminal syndicates and their people ha are incredibly well resourced and their people are incredibly skilled and well trained. So you're in a bit of a drag race with the bad actors who have built a culture around being really good at stealing things from companies and individuals. Uh, it's incumbent on us as CEOs in the mid market to understand our adversary there and build a culture of security where people are sharing in the responsibility of protecting and preserving the corporate assets that are critical to everybody's economic livelihood. It's not IT's job to do this by themselves. The whole culture, the whole management team, everybody has to work together to protect the company. It's the phrase I use is cybersecurity is a team sport. Thank you, Ken. That was excellent. Uh, Michael. Uh, we ask you to to look at and uh, deal with the people issues. Uh, I'm sorry, on the process side, uh, share with us um, some expert perspectives on process and why this concept of discipline is so important to how we function. Sure, great, thank you. Um, you know, we we have uh, accounting systems, and you know, we we put process in place. You know, we have you know gap accounting, and we follow standard rules um, for our manufacturing uh, you know environments. You know, we we have lean manufacturing, or we you know we've put in place ISO to uh, to to manage the the manufacturing process. We've even got quite good at you know sales and and putting in place processes uh, in our in our in our sales teams to uh, ensure success. But yet we continue to look at IT and especially cybersecurity as some kind of black art. Um, and it's not. You know, the use of proper frameworks, the use of proper um, regulatory guidance um, is, in, is an important step in being successful in, in defending your organization and more importantly your organization's data. Um, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, has developed the cybersecurity framework, originally developed for federal agencies, um, then pushed out to critical infrastructure, you know, uh, power grid, uh, energy generation, chemical plants, and now have come out with their version 1.1, which focuses on small and medium businesses and giving small and medium businesses the tools that they need, the frameworks that they need to be successful. Separate frameworks and, and security for a second from compliance. Um, compliance is what we see in HIPAA, what we see with PCI, NIST and ISO and other frameworks bring both security and compliance uh, to organizations. And these are not complex, uh, difficult practices. These are basic sets of controls that allow organizations to identify and mitigate risk. It starts with the ability to identify your critical assets, to understand where your data is, and to understand who has access to that data. You then move through a protect phase, where we talk about helping organizations protect their data. You know, what are the defensive controls that are in place? What are the technologies 
that are in place. And I, I, I tend to think at times we kind of overspend um, on the technologies. The, the third phase is a detect phase. How do you detect when something bad has happened? As Ken mentioned earlier, you know, cl- you know, folks that are hacked typically don't receive a warning, right? Ransomware is easy. It comes with a warning. Um, business email compromise, you know when you've transferred funds. But Sony only learned of its hack um, once the information was published on the, uh, the Internet. Then you need the ability to respond. Um, and I think this is one of the areas where most Vistage companies fall down. Um, you know, even if they you know, have robust defenses, they really don't have an incident response plan, a way to deal with when bad things happen. A communication plan, for example. You know, what do you tell your clients? What do you tell your customer support folks um, when you're in the process of handling a breach? And finally, you need to be able to recover. You need to be able to get your feet back up underneath of you and drive forward with your business. And this looks like a disaster recovery plan, you know, kind of the same disaster recovery plan that you'd want in place for a fire or a natural disaster, you should probably consider for uh, your cyber um, assets as well. Altogether, the NIST framework gives you a set of controls, a set of uh, clearly specific or, or clearly stated tasks that you can then sit down with your IT, whether it be internal or external, um, and address your cybersecurity concerns. You know, Michael, some of the very smaller companies, say in the one to ten million dollar range, might think that, oh, this is too complex for me. I don't need that much. I just throw a little Norton on here and bada boom, bada bang. Uh, that's really not the case, is it? That being small versus being a fifty or hundred million or bigger, the, the the issues are still the same. No, the issues are exactly the same. And I tell I tell folks all the time, this is about risk mitigation. This is about understanding where you are today and where you'd like to be in the future and building a roadmap to get yourself there. You know, this, you know, cybersecurity and compliance affects us all. You know, you know the numbers as well as I do. 62% of all cyber attacks are against small and medium businesses. Small and medium businesses, you know, suffer more when they're hit with cyber attacks. But yet CEOs and executives in those businesses don't focus on it as a discipline, as a, as a, as a set of controls they kind of handle it in a in kind of a whack-a-mole, you know, address the current problem uh, uh, methodology. When you when you speak with CEOs and you ask them about their cyber strategy and they they mumble or roll their eyes, uh, what is it you say to them? Well, you know, typically I, I get you know I, I ask the question when I'm in front of CEOs and I was in front of a, a group of uh, CPAs this morning. Um, I ask who's got their cyber under control, and, and you know, a large majority of folks raise their hand. And then I ask the simple question, do you have an acceptable use policy? You know, are, are you telling your employees how and, and when and where to store data um, and, how, and how to handle their internet access? And most of them don't. 85 to 90 percent of them don't even have something as basic as an acceptable use policy. So it, it's not about more technology. It's, it's about really embracing and developing a framework, just as you did in manufacturing, just as folks do on the accounting side. Um, and, and moving forward to improve security over time. Thank you, Michael. That was excellent. Uh, Mike Foster, let's move to you, please. Uh, share with us um, this the angle on technology, if you would. Well, and I really appreciate the perspectives that the other speakers are giving, too, about how important it is for the CEO to be involved. CEOs in general are not interested in learning about technology down deep. And I understand that. I appreciate that. They do need to be the ones who make some important decisions, such as the patches. That's really not a decision that should be made at the IT level to decide not to put patches on. It's much better if the CEO becomes involved in that conversation. The CEO needs to understand the risks of not patching systems, which, of course, would mean attackers can get into the system if it's not patched. And they need to understand, too, that applying a patch potentially could crash their systems. So then the CEO needs to make that choice because they're going to be the one who ultimately is responsible if there is some kind of breach and can't be letting IT make all these decisions on their own, which frequently they kind of force IT to do that. So it's really great to hear about the people side and how important it is. And I just want to echo what everybody else is saying, how CEOs need to be involved. And some are. And that's great. 
Um, so you asked me to talk about the technical aspects, and I want to do that. Last week, we were auditing a company down in Orlando, and Orlando, Florida. They had a virus coming up, a virus message every single week whenever they would run their antivirus scan. And the antivirus software would say, hey, no problem. I found this. I cleaned it up. It's not there anymore. And then, of course, at the next scan, they would get the same message. And the next scan, they would get the same message. Antivirus is important to have, but it's not that effective. The, the problem they're having is the virus knows how to dodge the antivirus. It changes itself. It moves around. And the antivirus program itself is never going to catch that. So we're helping them get their systems clean. But one of the biggest problems, what led to that, and why I share that story with you, is that on a lot of networks, users do have the ability to install software. So that way, if a user wants to install some program, anything from a, a weather app in their browser, all the way to some game, or maybe even software that they feel like is important to do their job, they have the ability to do so. And that's really dangerous. Because when a bad actor takes over a computer, they generally take over the computer at the same level as the user's privileges. So in other words, if the user's there and they have full administrative access over their own computer, when the user clicks a link, it brings in the attacker. The attacker now has full administrative use of the computer, which is why one of the things that's crucial to do, the, the three things we'll talk about, that's the second one, is that absolutely users have to be configured in such a way that they cannot install software and that takes added work because by default computers are configured so users can install software and then the third thing with patches being the first and reconfiguring users so they cannot install software the third thing is when computers get connected to a network automatically they're allowed to communicate with every other computer on the same network which at first glance that seems like a really good idea the problem with that is most users do not need their workstation to talk to other workstations on the network. And if their workstation can, if one user's workstation gets infected, now that infection can communicate with all the other computers and infect them too. So for example, you may have an employee named Fred. Fred goes to a coffee shop or he's on the road traveling. He connects at a hotel. His computer gets infected because those are great places to have your computer infected. Then he comes back to the office, connects to the network, probably wirelessly, and the infection on his machine now spreads to one or more of the other computers on the network. That problem is easy to solve. It doesn't cost any money. IT just needs to change a few settings in every computer, and this applies to Macs as well, so that those computers can only talk to the servers and printers and anything else that computer needs to talk to for business. However, the computer is locked down from just talking to the other computers on the network because that can lead to big problems. So three main things, and I'll, I'll wrap up, three calls to actions, things that people can do from a technology standpoint. Number one, be sure the patches are current and stay current, and that's a big job. There are a lot of companies that are hiring one employee just strictly to do patching. It takes that much time, and some of them are outsourcing to outsource companies to maintain their patching, which is fine. That company does need the company who's outsourcing the people listening to this call, they need to independently verify that patches are being installed and they can do that themselves. It's not complicated. Um, they can call me if they want to know how to do that. So the second thing after being sure your patches are installed is to make sure that all the users are configured in such a way that they cannot install software even if they want to. And that applies too at the top of the org chart. Sometimes executives think they want to be able to install their own software. And they should be able to, but they need to do that through their IT department because it's too easy to trick people if they're not fully IT savvy into installing something bad. Then the third call to action is be sure that IT is configured in at work so that the workstations cannot communicate with the other workstations. It'll just solve the problem of bad things traversing from one workstation to another. Wow, Mike, thank you. That was that was amazing. It's it, you begin to see why this metaphor of people process and technology in each one of your comments you all leaned into the other elements and and that creates this energy around cyber that suggests there is an opportunity to protect and defend uh, your data and as we move into this digital age and deeper into uh, the things that the future will give us with the technology it becomes all about our data and how we can manage our data 
Inside our report, under each one of these categories, people, process, and things, you'll find a series of recommendations and suggestions on how the things you need to be thinking about and how to pursue and act on them. Uh, we have a section on best practices where we talk about the current state of where our SMBs are. Uh, we have some questions for you to ask and an if yes or if no then responses. Again, all right, the concept here is we want you to be informed. Uh, we want you to make an educated decision and then you, you uh, address the level of risk assessment uh, that you're willing to accept when it comes to cyber. Um, what I'd like to do is come back to our panelists one more time, our Vistage speakers. Um, and if you were going to give us like one or two really hard hitting recommendations, and it doesn't have to be tied to people, process, or technology, but if you could just share just a couple things that you would want all CEOs in a small and mid-sized business space to be aware of, what would it be? And, and Ken, I'm going to come to you first again. Uh, my message uh, to CEOs as I travel is that uh, delegation of cybersecurity for the CEO is not an option. Uh, and what I can say is CEOs can't delegate, they can only abdicate. Uh, that's, the, that's the tagline. Uh, if you're going to abdicate this, you're giving away your authority as the CEO uh, by making it an IT problem. Uh, cybersecurity, uh, to just lean into the other speaker's comments, uh, particularly you know, as you look at uh, critical decisions that have to be made as it pertains to risk. Uh, data is the most important asset a company holds, not on its balance sheet. And the CEO, as the owner of the balance sheet and the owner of organizational value, has to be engaged in the preservation and defense of the balance sheet. Uh, that is going to require some decisions to be made uh, and political capital to be spent uh, getting people to do some of the things that they don't want to do. Uh, and uh, I, I strongly echo Mike's comment on, we're just working with an example very quickly. Uh, Spectre Meltdown uh, is one of the most uh, dangerous uh, elements out there for processors. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you said Inspector Meltdown? Spectre Meltdown is a, is a known uh, threat out there that compromises the Intel chip. Um, and we are working through kind of a war room session with the senior leadership team saying, here's the risks if you patch, and here's the risks if you don't. Um, and the IT team's like, somebody needs to make a call. Uh, this, is a, this is a very significant uh, organizational decision. Uh, and it was kind of a wake-up call, kind of an aha moment for a lot of the senior executives in that particular organization that this was well beyond the scope of what IT could handle uh, or was really, you know, organizationally should be deciding. Uh, so I, I think that's kind of the big uh, item I'd throw out there is that th this really requires, uh, again, cybersecurity is a team sport and CEOs can't abdicate this. They have to be engaged because their balance sheet is at risk. Excellent. Thank you, Ken. I greatly appreciate that. Michael, uh, let's move to you. Uh, some uh, some power recommendations you want to share with our CEOs. Thanks. Um, you know, one of the things I, I, I tell uh, organizations, I tell CEOs, and I, and I tell individuals when, when they talk about cybersecurity or how to protect themselves, um, is that necessarily you don't need to be the fastest gazelle, right? You just want to make sure that you're not the slowest. And I'll give you three recommendations that uh, folks can take away today that that really affect both their businesses, their personal lives uh, as well. Uh, first is we need to make sure that you're running quality endpoint protection software. Antivirus, anti-malware, uh, protect the endpoint. Make sure that, you know, that yesterday's viruses or last year's uh, uh, ransomware is not going to uh, reoccur and, and affect you. Number two is back up your data. Back up your data religiously. Uh, you should have three copies of the data data that resides that you know I'd, I'd call your production copy, what you're using, uh, a local data backup, and then finally offsite backup, right? So you've got production, local, and offsite backup, and, and make sure that you're testing your backup on, on a regular basis to ensure that you can recover should something bad happen. And finally, and we've heard it uh, several times, Michael? I think we lost Michael. Is everyone else still on? This yes, is I Mike Foster, and I, I promise I didn't hack him. 
<laughs> well, see, that's what happens. You start talking about this stuff. They're listening, man. They probably shut him down. Uh, <laughs> I was going to ask him. I, I wanted to ask him about data backup. Uh, I, I would give to you or back, you know, endpoint protection, back up okay. your data and, and cyber awareness training. Okay, Michael, we lost you for about 60 seconds there, maybe 90 seconds in the middle. Uh, but maybe just give us a replay real quick of your summary points again. Oh, I'm sorry. I, maybe, maybe it's a bad internet connection. Um, you know, it, it's protect your endpoint, uh, back up your data, and, and provide uh, security awareness training to your employees. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's go then to Mike Foster. Mike, what are those hard-hitting power recommendations you want to share with our CEOs? Well, I, in addition to keeping patches current, and being sure users can't be aren't allowed to install software and making sure the workstations can't talk to each other those are three we covered for the office i'd like to share with some people things they can do at home uh, number one what i'd like them all to do it'll help them tremendously is to turn on something called two-step verification this works on linkedin this works on many sites it's the most basic form imagine everyone's logged onto a website before and then they were prompted for a text message code that was texted to their phone. And that's really important because that way, if an attacker somewhere figures out your username and password, they still won't be able to log on unless they have your phone. And when you enable that, people are not going to get into your LinkedIn account and start sending out messages pretending to be you that either say terrible things or have a link in there saying, hey, click here, you're gonna like it, which of course takes you to a website called we're gonna hose you now .com. <laughs> So the second thing I'd recommend they, they do at home is be sure and apply those updates. It's just as important at home. Microsoft released 14 big updates on Tuesday. Hopefully everyone has already applied those, and if they haven't, they will soon. Uh, Apple just released some iOS updates too for the iPads and iPhones. Then the third thing I would share is to create a try it out this is actually very simple it sounds complicated but it's simple so i'll keep it short um, right now at home your users do have the ability to install software which means that an attacker when they get in can install software too so there's an easy solution to this and it's three steps what i like our listeners to do is number one at their home computer Create a new user. And it's just simple as going to control panel and creating users. And it'll say which one you pick local. It's not as hard as it sounds. But they create a new user. And then step two, they promote that user to be an administrator. So at this point, there are now two administrators. Your listener on the call right now and the new administrator account. Then the last step is, the third step is just demote their own user to be a standard user. And from then on, just use their standard user account and that way the bad actors won't be able to be an administrator on the computer. And if your user, the listeners ever do need to install software, it's no big deal. Their computer will just say, hey, I need to know the administrator password and you can install the software. However, if one of our listen, listeners clicks on an email link and all of a sudden out of the blue, the computer says, hey, you need to put in the administrator password, your listener will have just realized they missed a speeding bullet because that attacker is trying to install something on the user's computer that is going to do something bad. So at that point in time, our listeners would not put in the administrative password, only when they want to do something that they know requires, such as installing software. And this works on Macs and Windows as well. Wow, Mike, you brought us right back to where we started, the personal aspect. When was the last time, uh, apart from corporate data, you backed up your family pictures and, the, and those types of other things? Um, it's as important on the individual basis as it is on the, on the organizational basis. Well, our cyber experts are going to be hanging around to take some questions here in a few minutes. Uh, we want to make sure we allocate enough time for that. And what I wanted to do was try to bring this together um, uh, around the concept of what I'd really like people to walk away with, and that is that you're making a conscious decision about how you choose to protect the most valuable asset your business hands, and that's your data. It's the data about your customers, their billing information, uh, what type of products they use, uh, information about your employees, their W-2s, their wages, bank routing numbers, and your customers, and your financials. And everything that your business was wrapped around in data uh, is, is to be protected. We asked, uh, we asked in our survey at the beginning of the year what the largest area of investment would be among our CEOs, and technology was at the top of the list. CRM, 54%, financial, HRCM. 
Only 14% would identify cybersecurity as an area to invest. My concept is before you buy that next application, before you upgrade that next system, ensure that the systems, the technology, the infrastructure, and the data you have is protected. And you've made a conscious decision to that threat. The notion that 27% of our members do not have an active strategy concerns me greatly. That 62% of our members don't have an active strategy concerns me as well. I'd like, to, I'd like to raise the awareness of this issue and provide a path forward for those of you who choose to act on this and recognize the threat it has to your business. Uh, you lock your doors of your business at night. You keep your money in a bank for a reason. Your data, your technology, your customers, your financials, your employees, that's the most important data you have. So for the 38% with an active strategy, you must remain diligent. Cyber criminals are getting smarter. They're doing more elaborate things. You heard some of the stories from our experts. Uh, we're initiating some work right now on artificial intelligence for small business. We're gonna share with you uh, in the fall. And one of the first things that came up was how cyber criminals, and we heard an example of that story today, reside inside the system. And using artificial intelligence, they're able to now to align your data, your messages, your voice, your text, all the different forms of communication and understand the patterns of communication. And when that opportunity occurs, the AI will flag it for them as the opportune time to try to penetrate. By the same token, I know our cyber experts are using AI in the exact same way, but for a defensive purpose. By understanding the, the, the look of your communications, the flows of how you work, the words you use, when you see an anomaly, you can target that and see to identify, is that someone trying to slip in or is somebody in and trying to do something funny? You have to accept the fact that you will always be spending money to protect your customers, employees, and financial data. Call it the cyber tax, if you will, but you will pay me now or you will pay me later. And, and there is no debating and there is no denying that you will at some point in time uh, be a recipient of the attack in one form or another. For the 18% with a plan in development, hurry up. The 17% that is not current, you got to get back to work. Cyber threats are growing, evolving, and becoming more sophisticated. They're attacking individuals. They're using a combination of technology and social engineering. Um, they want to get what you have. And the degree to which your employees, uh, the processes that you have in place, and the technology used to defend is the equivalent of, of putting a, a, a security camera outside the loading dock, uh, putting a fence around the factory or any other forms of physical security we do to protect the security of our, our most important asset, non-monetary asset, our data. And for the 27% without a cyber strategy, I hope that through the course of this, of our conversation today, uh, you've motivated and you recognize the threat that exists for your business uh, and understand that liability, um, and Ken shared this with us, it, it still exists. Consciously deciding to not protect or defend your systems applications and data is putting your customers, employees, and financials at risk. You wear a seatbelt when you drove to work today, I assume, right? Hopefully you didn't need it. Hopefully you didn't need it. Uh, but you wear it for a reason because when you need it, you'll want it. The same thing goes with your cybersecurity. Um, it's money that you will spend. It will constantly require an evolution and uh, it will constantly be evolving, requiring updates and more money. And you need, and you have to spend this money. Uh, but again, only you can decide it's your business, it's your time, it's your energy, it's the responsibilities you have as a CEO for not just your business, but for the people that work there, their families, your community, and your customers. So I ask you to, to consider deeply uh, engaging and investing in a cyber uh, evaluation to understand where you are, which leads me to my last point. And that is that one of our data points that came out of our survey is that 67% of SMBs work with an external partner to help or manage their cybersecurity. Uh, it's not an expectation that the CEO or even a CIO or the IT specialist in a smaller business would have the level of expertise and knowledge to maintain and keep up with the speed of the cyber criminals. We're fortunate that we've got a, a community uh, within the Vista speaker community. We've been able to work with three of the very best today cyber experts. These are people who are specialists in this field who devote their time, energy, and their passion to helping you protect and defend your business. Uh, Ken, Michael, and Mike, Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you much for your insights and your input. Uh, your conversation has been, um, has been incredible. A great compliment to the report. And I wanna thank you for your time here today. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Ann um, and we'll take some questions and answers. So thank you all for your time and attention. And Ann, uh, I'll listen to you now. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. So we've talked a lot about the fact that there are uh, decisions that need to be made at the CEO level. And one of the data points in our survey is that 51% of SMBs have insurance. And so one of the questions we had is what are the types of insurance avail types of insurance available and some of their limitations and exclusions? So Ken, I know that this, you know, buying uh, cyber insurance is probably a CEO type decision. Can you speak a little bit to the types of insurance available? Certainly. Uh, I, I think it's uh, at the easiest level, I think there's two super categories to consider. One would be uh, insurance products that are designed to help an organization uh, deal with the funding of their breach response. Uh, the second super category would be liability based instruments that would deal with uh, aggrieved or injured third parties. So uh, most of the CEOs are very comfortable with third party insurance products. Uh, E and O, uh, those type of liability products have been in the market for a, quite a number of years. Uh, what we're seeing in the cyber insurance space is that uh, there's a lot of confusion around the differentiation between those two basic super categories. So they'll, we'll see like a bolt on to an E and O that really is focused primarily on third party lawsuits that would come out of uh, other injured organizations, customers, whatever be the case. Uh, breach response uh, components of an insurance uh, take on a very different set of characteristics. Uh, just as a really simple example, uh, according to the uh, National Congress of State Legislatures, uh, 30 states last year passed new or significantly toughened notification requirements about the loss of customer data as simple as first name, last name, home address, and phone number. Uh, that require businesses, if they lose that information, to notify everyone in the particular state and that particular state's attorney general. Uh, that notification expense on an average uh, incident can quickly climb north of a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, that's a very particular kind of rider that would be in a standalone insurance policy that would have nothing to do with a third party um, errors and omissions type of policy. So. I think it's important that, that members understand funding the breach response uh, the, uh, is, is a completely separate risk instrument uh, and is vitally important to their resiliency plan. Uh, revenue disruption, uh, there's, there's different kinds of coverages in there that are, are going to be uh, outside of the norm of kind of just basic liability instruments. Thank, thank you, Ken. I'd like to comment on that as well. And that is that um, cyber insurance is not a replacement for a cyber strategy. Rather, it is an element, and as Ken so eloquently shared, it is a way to mitigate some of that financial risk. Uh, just because you buy a life insurance policy doesn't mean you can smoke. And just because you've got cyber insurance doesn't mean you can ignore the other elements that we've spoken about here. Yeah, that's a great point, Joe. I, I think it's important for people to recognize uh, the acquisition of these policies uh, is going to require that you interact with the underwriters uh, and their experts in assessing and setting premiums based on the quality of the risk that the organization presents. Um, I, I run into far too many CEOs that think they can just paper this over and transfer the risk to an insurance company. Um, guess what? Their underwriters are pros and they know when there's a real program in place and when there isn't. Thank you, Ken. So this sounds like a topic that we could probably spend a lot of time on. And so perhaps one of our future blogs will be to go deeper into the types of insurance and considerations. Um, we did have a question about what are your thoughts on detection versus prevention? So Mike, I'm gonna direct that to you. Well, that's an easy one to answer. Detection is really, really important and it's difficult to detect, but there are some things you can do to detect what's going on. Um, but definitely my thoughts are, before you even think about detection, you absolutely need to take care of the prevention part first. So an example would be, well, security monitors, for example. I saw a news story this morning that they caught a thief in Canada who on video cameras walked into a museum or a place where they were displaying art and he took some of the, took a picture off the wall and walked right out. So they have very good video of this gentleman stealing a painting, but he was covering his head and face, so I'll probably never be able to do anything about it. So they detected him when in reality they would have been better off maybe locking the door or having a guard present or 
it's some other way of protecting that painting. So it's a good illustration. Um, so detection is good, but prevention is key. That's important. I, I tend to keep going back to the technical side, and I don't want to do that because that's too much of the call, but there is a, a website for the technical people who are listening. There's a website they may be familiar with put up by Microsoft, and it's a website called SIS Internals, S-Y-S-Internals.com. Redirects to Microsoft, and they have a tool you can get there that'll display every single program that launches on a computer whenever a computer's booted. And that's a good program to run because you can look at all the programs, and even though you may not realize what each program is or understand, look for a program on there that is called something like lowercase y, uppercase z, the number two, an exclamation point, just something very random. When you see a random program like that, it's probably an infection. So definitely prevent comes before detect. Okay, thank you, Mike. And I think we have time for one or two more questions. So Michael, um, to you, you talked about the NIST Cybersecurity Framework 1.1 that was released. And we have a question about while that's um, comprehensive, it seems like there's a lot to consider for a smaller mid-sized business organization. So are there any alternatives that might be better suited for a smaller mid-sized business? Yeah, you know, so there are a lot of different frameworks out there depending upon your industry. Um, so uh, manufacturers tend to, to focus more on ISO uh, because they're familiar with ISO 9000 for the manufacturing process. ISO's got uh, a version 27000 series uh, that's for cybersecurity. Folks that are in the healthcare space uh, tend to use the HIPAA framework. Um, the NIST framework, while it, it may seem daunting, um, really breaks down to a set of controls. And uh, as I've gone out and talked to uh, Vistage CEOs, you know, there's five core areas. Within those five core areas, there's 22 subcategories. And, and for, for a small business, for, for you know, a business that's under 100 employees, maybe they just look at the, those 22 controls, uh, uh, subcategories, um, as a way to kind of grade themselves or, or approach cybersecurity. But ultimately, there's a list of about 140 controls in the NIST framework. Um, and it is, a, it is, I think, a manageable process. They don't have to take it all on at once. Uh, as Mike just said, you know, you start with identifying your risk, identifying your assets, and then protecting them, right? You know, protect is step two. Detect is step three, right? So they could take a phased approach on how they implement something like the NIST uh, framework. Excellent. And just at, in, uh, we have a lot of questions about third party um, company server platforms and third party vendors that store credit card information. How does uh, storing data or credit card information change, um, add to your risk or mitigate risk? You know, I would say that, you know, trusting a third party, whether that third party be a data storage um, uh, facility or you know, salesforce.com where you have data. Um, it's really about risk transfer, right? You're transferring the risk there to somebody else. Um, and, and, you know, you need to make sure that you're choosing your partners wisely, um, that your partners have, you know, a defined cybersecurity strategy um, and, and that you're placing your data uh, and your information um, with trusted partners. It, it can't just be that you're going to, you know, Joe's garage and data storage. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, we would all agree that that's probably not where we would want to put patient data. Um, you know, that we would look for something with a higher degree of uh, security, a higher degree of certainty. But it, transferring that risk via third parties is, is an excellent way, especially for small businesses, to protect things that they can't afford or don't have the expertise to protect themselves. Thank you Just so much, Michael. That, oh, go ahead. A quick note. That, uh, I, I strongly agree. Uh, outsourcing and third-party relationships are a great way for small mid-market to gain access to talent that they, they couldn't afford uh, or compliance programs that somebody like a Microsoft or a Salesforce can bring to the table just because of their 800-pound gorilla status. But the court's been super clear here. The CEO and the CFOs in particular have to make sure that they're validating and reviewing 
their vendors and partners cyber po you know policies and postures on a an, on an annualized cadence this isn't a you you cannot do fire and forget risk transfer uh you have to be reviewing these things on a regular cadence otherwise that risk is going to come right back into the organization Thank you, Ken. And so before we wrap up, we want to make sure there's a lot more about this topic so that you know where to download this information. So we do have the full report that we've referenced um, several times on Vistage.com in the Research Center. And it currently is in the carousel on the front page, Cyber Threats and Solutions for Small and Mid-Sized Businesses. So you'll be able to download that report if you have not al already read that. And that contains some of the insights today as well as some more details on how you can get started and some key considerations for who has responsibility at different levels. So I'd like to thank you all for attending today. Vistage Research, um, our goal is to become the CEO's most trusted resource for research data and expert perspectives like the ones we've shared today on the issues, topics, and decisions of business optimization and leadership enhancement. So before we leave you today, I want to make sure you know about our upcoming Fridays with Vistage webinar that'll be on August 24th, and that's Engage Teams, the key to unlocking maximum productivity with our speaker, Adam Weber. So again, this is a part of a series from Vistage and Vistage Research. And as Joe mentioned, we have our next study that we'll be releasing in the fall on artificial intelligence. And we also plan to host another Fridays with Vistage webinar in uh, October on this topic as well. So thank you all for attending. Thank you to Joe and our experts for an excellent conversation. And I feel like this is just getting us started on the topic. So please feel free to reach out to, to us at Vistage Research or to any of the experts we've identified. Thank you so much and have a great day.